I like to go back to um, like sort of the fundamentals of, of physics as well, right? As more people use a blockchain, it's always going to get more expensive. So as much as you want to advertise low fees, um, at some point, if your chain becomes popular, it is going to get relatively expensive, right? So the question becomes, what comes after that, right? If your chain has higher fees, you know, are you going to still provide the value you provided when your fees were just like a penny or less? And how are you going to handle that? When you look at Swissborg, 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 Swissborg is sorti ce matin. They have an app where you can buy crypto. They connect to Binance, HitBTC, LMAX, and Kraken and find the best rates in the market. What I like about Swissborg is that they have an amazing app that can directly buy cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and also cash out as well. Through Swissborg, all assets will have a fiat gateway. And here is the thing. Premium features gives you zero fee trading. That is zero fee. If you want to buy Bitcoin with fiat, I suggest you buy through Swissborg rather than Coinbase. And if you're interested in trading the likes of Ethereum or Bitcoin, use Swissborg's application. Dear crypto community blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind blowing guest, Pong Zon, CEO Tendermint, the first team behind the Cosmos network and blockchain. And we're going to talk about third gen blockchains, compare Cosmos with other chains so that you can really understand what is the value proposition and why this project has so much adoption. But before we kick off, a shout out to Nate at Crypto Slate for always giving us summarized version of these interviews so you can get access to the written format as well. And without further ado, let's kick off. Pong, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Alex. Thanks for having me here. Really excited about chatting about Cosmos. Same here, same here, Pong. And you know, I was just in Paris a few weeks ago and I met one of the Ethereum developers who told me that he was actually really excited about the Cosmos network as well. And before jumping into Cosmos and the blockchain and network, I would love to ask you a simple question, Pong. Like, What made you so excited to just dive into this crazy world of crypto? Was it Bitcoin? Was it an actual blockchain infrastructure or network? What really you know, took your heart and soul to, to join this space? Well, like for most people in the, in the space, I think Bitcoin um, popped on my radar uh, you know, like almost a decade ago, right? And um, that was one of the biggest changes that we've we've seen, you know, since probably the biggest innovation over the last decade or so. Um, but beyond that, right, the, uh, crypto is pretty exciting just because it's the um, the ability for programmable value to be exchanged and for people to, you know, for programmers to be able to use that in all sorts of really crazy ways. So the other thing that really made me dive into crypto is, uh, is my passion for, for playing video games, actually. So I, I love RPGs, right? Collecting loot, killing monsters, collecting gold, et cetera. And uh, so much of this, I feel like, can be um, brought over to the, to the crypto world. You know, the gamification of, of, of tokens, um, encouraging people to, to earn online. You know, a lot of it's very reminiscent of, of role-playing games and MMOs. So those are, I guess, the two, two reasons. That's super cool. I think a lot of us growing up from the 80s and 90s also love killing monsters as well. Definitely I do. <laughs> and I would love to ask <laughs> you, sure. you know, <laughs> in order to, you know, one of the big questions that I think a lot of people struggle to wrap their head around is, you know, what makes a quality blockchain? You know, um, to me personally, obviously, like as an investor, the the two most bullish 
asset classes for me is probably number one, the protocol or the infrastructure that holds everything. And then two, it would probably be the projects with fundamentals, such as centralized exchange tokens or DeFi protocols that actually generate revenue. Uh, but I would love to ask you, like when you're looking at blockchains, like what is the criteria that really ticks the boxes for you to want to say, okay, I think this is a great project against a project that might not be that great? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I fully agree with you. I think, you know, the protocol is is super important. A sound protocol, you know, a solid use case. Those are also really important. But I think what really excites me the most is when I see an incredibly passionate community of supporters, right? Mm -hmm. Like a grassroots level support and, and people just playing around with the tech. You know, maybe there there isn't product market fit yet. Or maybe they have no idea what it's capable of. But um, it shows that there's a lot of potential. And those are the projects that I, I love looking into. I couldn't agree more with you. I wholeheartedly see the community as the most important piece of the puzzle. But as you know, a lot of people, they also talk about like gas fees and transactions per second. Are there any other criteria on top of that, which you think is really important when evaluating blockchains? Yeah, so gas fees and scalability, they're, they're very important. But at the same time, as more people use a blockchain, it's always going to get more expensive. So as much as you want to advertise you know, low, low fees, um, at some point, if your chain becomes popular, it is going to get relatively expensive, right? So the question becomes, what comes after that, right? If your chain has higher fees, you know, are you going to still provide the value you provided when your fees were just like a penny or less? And how are you going to handle that, right? And we're seeing Ethereum tackle that right now, um, you know, trying to go for ETH 2.0 and also all the projects building, you know, layer two scalability solutions on ETH. Um, that's really where I'm looking at, you know, the long-term success of a project and then what that means for how much it costs to use it. So is it correct to say that transaction fees and the speed is a bit overrated when evaluating a, a blockchain? And, and what are some indicators where you think, okay, this shows that there's long-term long sustainability? Is it perhaps, you know, uh, the actual fees that are generated to, to provide revenue for the network to continue? And, and what are some pieces I'd love to hear? Even the most craziest ideas are completely fine. Yeah, um, maybe this is less crazy, but I always go back to the Web 2.0 world. Um, my background is web development and, and and UI design, right? And some of the projects that became incredibly popular, you know, over time, you know, services like Twitter, etc. Um, they they built MVPs, you know, with with things like Ruby on Rails, but then it quickly became unscalable as they mm. get in, you know started getting hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of users. So the the ability for a project mm. and its core developers to scale something that they have, you know, from hundreds of thousands of users to hundreds of millions of users is something that um, is really important, right? And we're not going to see that. Uh, it's going to take time over the next few years, but the projects that successfully scale to hundreds of millions of users are, are the ones that are really going to succeed. And that makes a lot of sense, you know, the scalability to have all these users and the adoption on the chain, because it's true, like, like you said, you know, a lot of chains will talk about how fast they are, how cheap they are, but they don't have many projects in their ecosystem are actually using the chain. So uh, these are some very, very valuable points. And you just mentioned ETH 2.0. As you know, you know, we've been hearing news about Ethereum trying to accelerate its path towards Serenity, Ethereum 2.0 by possibly doing ETH 1.5 this year. How optimistic or pessimistic are you on this transition? It seems like it's a lot of work to, to actually make this happen and would love to hear you know, the tech side of you. Yeah, as someone who's been working in crypto since late 2015, um, I would expect everything to take about three times longer than you expect it to take, even when taking into account how long you think it might take. I'm optimistic that ETH 1.0, 1.5 will be out there. I don't know if it'll be out there by the end of the year. Um, but I'm still incredibly bullish on Ethereum as a whole. I think there's just so much mind power behind it and they're gonna solve problems, you know, no matter how long it takes. But obviously there's a lot of competitors coming up that, that wanna take away some of that thunder. That's very, very cool. And you know what? What I really love, Pong, is that whenever I I hear I see messages from Cosmos, you know, on Twitter or if it's, you know, on a Medium blog, you know, you guys are so elegant and diplomatic. I never see you bashing or criticizing other chains and always showing support, even when other chains are having difficulties. So really the mindset, that community mindset that you guys have is amazing. I want to take my hat off, even though I don't have a hat right now for that specific point. But Moving to Cosmos, obviously, like no need to bash other chains, but I would love to hear from you what makes the Cosmos network and blockchain special or unique at this point. 
Yeah. So like you mentioned earlier about how our community acts, you know, and, and, you know, treats other blockchains and even other competitors is that we have just a, a different mindset, right? We are here to embrace every other blockchain. Um, we're the connector, the bridge to all chains. Um, that's the original purpose of Cosmos. And those are the tools that we're building. Uh, we imagine a future where every blockchain will be connected to each other and be able to exchange value, you know, across chains, whether it's, you know, single hop or through, you know, tens of hops or hundreds of hops, you know, we're here to create the internet of blockchains or as we like to call it, the interchain, like uh, the, the web 3.0 parallel to the internet. It does sound like, you know, Cosmos is a bit similar to Polkadot in the sense that, as you know, Polkadot are creating parachains so that people can have their own independent chain and just rely on consensus algorithms from Polkadot. Is Cosmos somewhat similar because Cosmos is a network, decentralized network of independent parallel blockchains? Is it similar or completely different? It is similar, but at the same time, it's a uh, bigger in scope. Uh, we have a more ambitious roadmap, right? Um, our vision is the future of a million blockchains. Um, while in Polkadot, the, they're taking a more, uh, I would say, a pragmatic approach. And they're starting with, let's say, 100 parachains. Um, another difference is that parachains, right, sort of rely on developers to build the front up some funds to pay for one of these parachain slots. You know, they're going to be hotly contested over because Polkadot is so valuable and you're going to reach so many users um, by having a parachain slot. So that becomes a little bit competitive. It becomes um, quite expensive. And, and generally, the more funded, the more well funded, you know, parachain projects will get. Uh, the guaranteed slots, while the ones that are more experimental might not be able to. Um, but in the Cosmos land, right, there are no such thing as, as parachain slots. So how Cosmos works is every chain launches independently of every other. And um, they are also not required to connect to any other chain either. So in fact, every new chain created in Cosmos is its own separate startup. It's its own separate website, if you can uh, use that metaphor. And does uh, Cosmos, is it really open for any type of project? You know how VeChain, for example, they've chosen a specific niche, uh, which is the supply chains, right? They want to be the ultimate protocol layer for supply chains. Does Cosmos have, is it enterprise only or does it have a specific niche or is it just completely open to anyone who wants to build their own blockchain? It is completely open. So anything that can be expressed, you know, with a decentralized database, um, it can be done with the Cosmos SDK. We have people building all sorts of things like um, decentralized cloud providers. Um, we have people building tools for Ethereum developers, right? There's a project to add the EVM on top of Cosmos. There are people building social media platforms using Cosmos tech. Uh, essentially anything you can imagine that can be put into a database, it can be built on Cosmos. And we're not opinionated on this. Very nice. I love the neutral, you know, hipster, easygoing approach that you guys have. Um, and what about the de levels of decentralization? You know, that's another huge debate on choosing chains, right? And the consensus algorithms. How much does that matter to you personally when judging different chains, the level of decentralization and consensus algorithms? Yeah, so decentralization is incredibly important. In the Cosmos world, we, we use something like delegated proof of stake, right? Where there are 100 validators that, that validate a particular chain. And... Uh, you know, it is more centralized than something like, you know, ETH or BTC, where there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of miners around the world, you know, all vying for the next block. So there is more centralization risk for a specific Cosmos blockchain. But of course, like I mentioned before, this is only one chain, right? When you have hundreds of chains, thousands of chains, millions of chains, you can um, say that decentralization is actually stronger in Cosmos than a lot of other chains, just because each chain is is siloed in terms of security from, from every other chain, if that makes sense. I see. That means if one chain or even a hundred chains are taken down, you know, the other thousands of chains will still live. Yeah, because when you have your independent chain, it depends on the actual company if they want it to be more centralized or decentralized. It's not up to Cosmos exactly. to, to actually dictate that, every right? Community has its own set of validators. They can use, you know, they can use 20 validators if they want to be centralized. If they, you know, let's say they're a centralized exchange, right? There's really not much need to use a whole bunch of validators. 20 maybe is enough. That's what Binance Chain, which is built on Cosmos Tech, uses. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you have chains using 200, 300 validators. Um, and that also works as well.
I was about to actually follow up with the Binance Smart Chain. So for you, like, you know, a lot of criticism comes from the fact that Binance Smart Chain has compromised decentralization to get more speed and lower costs. Uh, is that fine with you? Is it still a good use case? What are your thoughts on Binance Smart Chain? So I haven't really looked into Binance Smart Chain, but I understand it's sort of like a fork of Ethereum that has, you know, um, a smaller number of, of block producers, right? Um, I think that's exactly what, you know, something like Cosmos is meant for, right? It allows the creation of lots of different experiments, some more centralized, some more decentralized. And it's really based on the community itself to decide if they want to participate in it or not, right? So core to the ethos of Cosmos is the ability to exit, uh, which which goes to, I guess, one of the really coolest parts of Cosmos. Amazing. Very, very cool, Pong. And you just mentioned, I think, a really important point, which is the ecosystem and companies or projects that are actually using the chain, right? We talked about this a little bit earlier with scalability, but talking specifically about the ecosystem and the Cosmos network, it looks like you guys have a lot of people building on Cosmos, which is a very positive sign. Do you mind sharing a little bit about what is the adoption currently out at Cosmos? First of all, there are a lot of projects, but, um, but there are also some very valuable projects. If you look at sites like CoinCap or CoinGecko, uh, four out of the top 25 most valuable chains in the world are built on Cosmos. So these include um, Binance Coin, uh, Terra, uh, Crypto.com Coin, and the Cosmos Hub itself. Amazing. So, but beyond that, um, there's roughly 30, 31 mainnets live right now. And they have a combined, you know, to total market cap of over 85 billion. Yeah, I saw that on, on Twitter, actually. By the way, guys, don't forget to follow Pong on Twitter. So uh, uh, at ZCPung, P-E-N-G. Uh, so $90 billion in digital assets are being secured on Cosmos as of today. Go yeah, ahead. those are only the chains that are live, right? There's uh, over 200 projects being developed currently and uh, more coming down the line. I think people are realizing, you know, how much value is provided for free right now with the Cosmos SDK. And if you want to build your own layer one, this is the way to do it. You know, save yourself years and years of R&D, build on something that costs you nothing, but gives you all of these benefits that, you know, chains like BNB are using. So, so far in terms of criteria, just to sum it up, by the way, guys, if you think there are other points that are really important when evaluating blockchains, feel free to put them in the comments section below so that we can hear from you and share more perspectives. So, so far we talked about levels of decentralization. We talked about consensus algorithm. We talked about scalability, throughput, transaction fees, and if I'm not wrong, adoption in ecosystems, right? But I'd love to follow up on the specific scalability criteria. Like, how will Cosmos focus on scalability in the future? That's one thing that scares a lot of people. And you said it's extremely valuable, right, for a blockchain because you have so much adoption. And like you said, many test nets that soon will become main nets. Uh, how do you guys ensure that you will be scalable and sustainable in the future? Yeah. So at a high level, right? Cosmos allows scalability by encouraging people to build new chains whenever they have a new application idea, right? So unlike Ethereum, where you, you know, they're supposed to spin up a smart contract for a new application idea and then stick it on Ethereum mainnet. In Cosmos, we really encourage you to build your own blockchain and put your application idea on that blockchain. Uh, there's many ways to write your, your blockchain. Uh, we have um, a current smart contract solution um, based on the WebAssembly. Right, so WebAssembly allows you to compile from all, like lots of different languages into WebAssembly bytecode, which is um, most popularly used in the browser. Right, so there are some applications that are just you know require so much performance. Uh, if you're a designer, you may have heard of Figma, that's built using Wasm WebAssembly, and that allows for incredibly high performance applications directly in your browser. Well, um, what we have in Cosmos is this project called Cosm Wasm, which wraps this WebAssembly interpreter into a, a blockchain, allowing you to write smart contracts, you know, in, in Rust, in Go, in, in JavaScript, in I think in TypeScript, right? Um, that's one way of doing it. Uh, you can also build a chain using Golang directly, which is the, the primary language of the Cosmos SDK. So yeah, so one application for one chain is generally how we see it. But obviously if an application becomes very popular, right? Let's say someone does manage to make a successful social media clone on a blockchain, right? Generally, social media um, applications are, you know, not really the best use case for a blockchain because of how much it costs transaction-wise, right? And if you're mm. doing like a, a tweet or if you're just leaving an emoji on someone's message, you don't want to be paying 10 cents for that, right? But um, let's say you decide to build something that has a huge amount of transaction volume. 
eventually you're even going to, you know, outgrow one blockchain. So this is where we introduced the idea of sharding, which allows you to, you know, run multiple blockchains using the same application code and sync them together every so often. Okay. Yeah, I dived a little more technical than I wanted to, but uh, to take it back up a bit, um, obviously scalability is something we care a lot about and it's one of our, of our core core values. But, you know, to get people to use this stuff, it is really difficult, right? And where are people right now, right, in crypto? Most of them are on ETH doing stuff with NFTs or DeFi, right? So we have a, a few strategies as well to help Ethereum users um, with transaction costs. There's one topic, obviously, since you love video games and a bit of a geek as well in that sense, you know, like NFTs is one of the, the massive topics. Uh, and a lot of people are wondering if we're going through a bubble. A lot of people are wondering, you know, which blockchain will have the biggest NFT platform. Myself, personally, I would never buy NFTs on small platforms. I'm not sure if they'll be able to pay the bills. And if their servers get cut out, I lose my NFT. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'd love to hear your view. I'm sure you have a really, really interesting view on NFTs and and how important would that be uh, for the Cosmos network? But also, is this something that is as big as it is? Is it a bit of a bubble? Anything you want to throw at us, please go for it, Bung. <laughs> yeah, so NFTs is definitely a bubble. But at the same time, it's going to see incredible growth over, let's say, the next decade. Uh, I think everything in the real world can be represented as an NFT. But more than that, right, as companies, you know, larger companies are exploring augmented reality and virtual reality, right? These sort of environments are very conducive to NFTs and to allow people to, to showcase what they have, you know, what they have bought, what they own, et cetera, via, you know, a variety of, of augmented reality mediums. Let's say just wearing glasses and seeing someone walk around with, you know, a one of 100 NFT earrings, you know, <laughs> that only appear in AR, right? Is, is going to be really exciting. And it really brings, you know, everything we've been doing inside of games, right, to the real world. And so what would the criteria be for you to trust the platform enough to actually purchase an NFT for the long term? The platform itself needs to have existed for, for a long time. And also it needs to have a lot of value secured behind it before I consider purchasing an NFT, right? You don't want to be buying an NFT in a you know, sort of fly-by-night blockchain that will disappear the next week when people, you know, lose interest in it. So... You know, Ethereum is one of the best places to to generate NFTs, but you know, is it the best place to to keep your NFTs? Right? Maybe not. Depending on how valuable the NFT is, right? Obviously, if you have a you know, ten thousand dollar piece of art, you know, paying hundreds of dollars of transaction fees is you know, arguably okay. But let's say you're a new artist and you want to create some fifty dollar NFTs, right? Um, Ethereum's way outside of your budget to even start participating in. Like if you list your item, it costs fifty bucks. And, you know, you might not ever see any return on that if people don't buy your, your piece of work. So there's a couple things we're doing in Cosmos. Um, we're exploring many NFT solutions in Cosmos, but I should probably back up a bit. Um, before we talk about like even NFTs or even tokens on Cosmos, I need to talk about one of the most important things that the Cosmos brings to the table. Like I mentioned before, from the very beginning, we're here to bridge all blockchains, right? And I mentioned before about how there's hundreds of blockchains in Cosmos. Uh, so how does it work, right? Are people just using the Cosmos SDK, building sovereign chains, and, and that it? That's not really all that we're here for. So we've been working really hard on this protocol called the Inter-Blockchain Communication Protocol. This is IBC. And it's a way for people to exchange tokens and NFTs across blockchains. And as of today, um, there's two blockchains that have enabled it. Well, they enabled it last week. Uh, this is the Cosmos Hub blockchain, the Atom chain, and IrisNet, the Iris chain. And so these are the very first two blockchains in Cosmos who have enabled interchain token transfers. So this is the um, the transfer of tokens and NFTs from one Cosmos chain to another Cosmos chain, mm -hmm. and even to chains you know that are not built on Cosmos altogether. Um, we've been talking about all the you know the thirty chains that have ninety billion worth of value, the two hundred projects that are building on Cosmos, and that's not you know. The only thing that makes Cosmos unique, right? Obviously, anyone can use Bitcoin today, right? And fork Bitcoin and build their own thing. That's what happened, I think, years ago, like 2014, yeah. 2015. A lot of that was happening. Yeah. And you can do that with Cosmos. But the reason why we built this SDK in the first place is this idea of inter blockchain communication, or IBC for short. So, IBC is a protocol that allows for the transfer of data across blockchains. 
So today we have just two blockchains, two main nets that have enabled this. Uh, one is the Cosmos Hub, the Atom token, uh, which we helped to create. And then one is the, the Iris net, Iris token. And so as of last weekend, we've seen the very first cross-chain token transfers happen. It's, it's a really exciting time. And there are a large number of, of mainnet projects that I mentioned before that are also working to enable IBC over the coming weeks. I think, you know, that interchain token economy is going to be critical, especially like you said, with NFTs. So would it be fair to say, like Pong, that in terms of NFTs, you wouldn't personally invest in something that requires like long store of wealth, like a painting or or something. And for the time being, just because the ecosystem is being built, you would more use it for like video games and things that are more easily interchangeable? Yeah, I would. I mean, I would definitely be conservative in what NFTs I buy right now. Um, to be honest, I haven't bought a single NFT. I, I've been having a lot of fun watching people buy them. But um, <laughs> I've been so focused with the rest of the team, you know, building Cosmos stuff that that uh, is something that I just watch from the sidelines. And uh, just to follow up on one of the, something you mentioned a little bit earlier, you're talking about Atom. You know, one thing that's cool about the DOT token, you know, in Polkadot is you, you need to own DOT in order to be eligible for the auctions, right? So it's a battle of the auctions, which has a great tokenomics, you know, for the actual DOT token. Uh, is it a little bit similar with uh, Atom where, you know, people who want to use the Cosmos SDK and build their own chain, they will acquire uh, Atom tokens eventually. And the more adoption you are, the, you have, the more people will actually own the Atom tokens. Is it similar or how does it work exactly in terms of tokenomics? Yeah, so explaining it in terms of difference to, to Ethereum and Polkadot is probably the, the right way to go. So with both Ethereum and Polkadot, how it works is you need to own the base token. It's ETH, it's DOT, right? To be able to start yeah. building stuff on the main net. Um, in Cosmos, you don't have to own the Atom to build anything on Cosmos, right? Um, and that's why you see some centralized exchanges like, like Binance and, and OKCoin, et cetera, Crypto.com, use the Cosmos SDK for their own purposes to build sort of like a more centralized chain for themselves. Mm. And where the Atom gains value is through IBC. So through the power of cross-chain token transfers, you know, interchain transfers, we are building a marketplace and we're building the best marketplace, the biggest marketplace in Cosmos. And it's a place where you want to be. Um, like if you take the analogy that um, Ethereum is like, it's like a, it's a very sort of very dense downtown, like, like Manhattan, right? And then Cosmos is the suburbs. Cosmos is the farmlands beyond the suburbs. And so what the Cosmos Hub and what the Atom represents is it represents the sort of the, the biggest, biggest city center within you know, this suburban farmland area. And what happens, let's say every weekend, to take this analogy a bit further, is people from the farms bring all their produce you know, on the back of their trucks to this, this great farmer's market that has everything you can imagine. Due to the incredible amounts of liquidity, the different amounts of assets, you know, ranging from NFTs to to normal tokens, to you know, new chain launches, et cetera. All of that activity happens on the Cosmos Hub. So it's not required for you to bring any of your goods there. But if you want to be somebody in Cosmos, right? if you want to participate in, in the greater Cosmos economy and really avail yourself to all the sorts of different types of things in Cosmos, you likely want to transfer your tokens to the Cosmos Hub and do your trade there. Amazing. I love the analogy, by the way. My grandma, Susie, will be very happy to have these simplified analogies to, to better understand Ethereum as a city and Cosmos has the suburbs and the land and the farms. It's, it's a really yeah, cool Yeah, so analogy. in Ethereum, right, everyone needs to, you know, pay rent or pay taxes yeah. to, to the city of New York or, you know, to your landlord. Um, in Cosmos, you don't have to pay that. So when, when, you, when you create your own farm, when you create your own blockchain in Cosmos, right, you're, you're claiming land that has never been claimed before. Um, so you don't owe anyone anything, but at the same time, you need to provide your own security, right? You probably need to have um, your own weapons to defend against wild animals, to defend <laughs> against, um, you know, sort of anything out there because, you know, the police doesn't really go out that far. But in return, you get all the freedom in the world to build whatever you want and whatever you end up building, you know, you should bring to the marketplace and exchange for what you need. That's the Cosmos philosophy.
Well, thank you so much, Pung, for coming on the show. We're really excited about what is in the future for Tendermint and what you guys are doing behind the Cosmos Network. And guys, if you like this show, don't forget to like, subscribe, and blast that bell notification so you get access to more of these timeless interviews with these great crypto educators. We look forward to seeing you again next week, Wednesday, premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock GMT. See you next week, guys. Thank you.